the speaker notes. Uh, Zach is a principal platform engineer at Alembic, and he's the author of the ASH framework, which is a resource-oriented declarative design framework for Elixir. Y'all heard of that? When not programming, he's hanging with friends and fam, taking trips in his RV, and studying Japanese. Here's Zach. Give a round of applause for Zach. <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> Domain modding elevator. All right. Um, thanks, everybody, for having me. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, domain modeling. And I'm calling it elevated, but uh, that was the result of a long brainstorming session that did not produce um, great results. So uh, we have an outline here. We're going to talk about domain modeling. We're going to talk about a tool called Spark. We're going to talk about uh, Ash. We're going to talk about resources, um, some advanced features of Ash, how it is extensible. Uh, Steve is going to be a fan of that. We're talking about what's new and what's coming up as well with Ash. So it's a bit of a hybrid talk about domain modeling, the intersection of that with Ash framework, um, and then we'll, ta we'll tack on some Ash bits at the end. Okay, so when we think of domain modeling, I think a lot of people think of this sort of pre-step before you build the thing that you're going to build, where you like write it all up on a on a whiteboard and you like draw boxes and you put like a and you draw a line and you say like this thing calls this, or maybe you use like some modeling language or something like that. Um, and this is what we look like while we do it. Um, so I would say even if you don't do that, even if you don't see domain modeling as an active part of the things that you do. Um, you are doing it. It's the only way that these things happen. Um, and you're doing it even if you don't realize it. Um, so here's an example of something. So uh, I should have had a slide in here for this. But uh, when you're doing domain modeling, that generally includes things like your interfaces, your data, um, the interactions between that data, and also the expectations that you can have out of that system. Like if I create a post, I should probably be able to get my post back out. These are all parts of like the domain that you're building, how this problem that you're solving uh, works and how your solution works. Um, so let's talk about ways that you do this every day. Your interfaces are, in a lot of cases, if you're building things with Phoenix and context and things like that, you're writing, you know, create post or whatever in a, in a context, that's an interface and that's part of your domain. Your data, if you have an ECTA schema, that's also going to be part of your domain. Um, typically what you would consider part of your domain is like what you expose to the end user, which is likely not just going to be the schema itself. Um, side effects, like the fact that whenever, whenever somebody makes a post, we're going to tell all of the subscribers of that user that a new post happens. Like That's also part of the domain, and that's things that your users expect to happen. Um, so domain modeling is also sort of at the intersection of business and technology, right? So something that's not, like here, here's a good example, right? Product says, hey, when a new user signs up, we want to send them a welcome email. And then you get some code like send welcome email somewhere in your application. And so th this is where you cross that divide. Something like, you know, optimizing some part of your system. That's not domain modeling. That's like solving for real life constraints that we deal with. Um, but it's not really a part of your domain. Um, and there is no like one size fits all method for this. And not and every domain is special. So you can't solve the same problems the same way everywhere, and otherwise you end up with things like this. All right, so I'm going to segue real quick to talk about a tool called Spark. Um, so I think one of the things that you see when you do domain modeling, I've built lots of different apps. I've been a contractor for a while, um, and I support a lot of m Ash users, and so I've kind of like, I've worked on, I don't know, hundreds of apps at this point. Um, and one of the things you see is every one of these apps has its own little mini language. Even if it's not a real DSL that you might consider like somebody made this a language, there is a language of your app. So if you use caches, if you use um, you know, all of your little building blocks, you start talking about that and, and it becomes this shared language between you and your team. And what I believe is that most problems deserve a DSL in their own right and that you should be intentional about the design of that DSL. So Spark is a tool that we've built that uh, is a DSL builder. <laughs> so it lets you make your own DSLs that look like what you would expect a sort of conventional Elixir DSL to look like. So this is a Spark DSL. This is how ash.resource works. So in Ash, all of our DSLs are built with Spark. Um, <coughs> don't worry too much about the details here. but uh, So Spark sets the core design patterns for Ash, uh, which is the idea that you have uh, declare a declaration, like your resource or whatever else that you're building out of your DSL. And then you have... Um, introspectability, where you can fetch that information out. In a lot of ways, it's mostly like a rich, elixirish data structure. 
Um, so you can see, it, you know, we can ask the, the DSL for some information about it, and there's a chance for it to maybe transform it or provide, you know, some, some computed information, things like that. But it makes DSLs in general less magic. So this is what it looks like in Spark, right? When we have this, this is what an attribute in Ash is, how it's actually defined. We say this is an entity, and this is going to actually define all of the stuff under the hood that makes it work. Um, you can see we use, uh, you, I don't know if this is kind of small for you, actually. Anyway, uh, it's all typed, and it's all validated at compile time. It's documented, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then each DSL is actually extensible. So we do extens extensibility at the entity sort of level, at the DSL level. So for instance, if you have a resource, you can define an, an extension. In this case, this is an example from one of our little micro extensions. It's called Ash Archival, which will make your resource uh, archive and you know, soft delete instead of actually delete. And you can actually add to the DSL of the thing you're extending. So you get your own little area and your own configuration, um, and it sort of fits with the bigger structure. Um, <coughs> so Spark is used outside of Ash as well. It's one of the main reasons we brought it out is because we knew it would be pretty useful. Um, this is an example from um, uh, Lucas, you know him as Dorgan and on like Discord and other places uh, with something called Channel Handler. So this is a DSL for building uh, well-structured Phoenix channels. Um, this is one called Reactor, also very small, sorry. I really didn't think about that, did I? Um, <laughs> so. Uh, Reactor is a tool that uh, one of the people that I work with is building for like graph resolution engines where you have all these steps and they require the results of other steps, kind of like you know, GitHub CI or something like that. Um, that's just another picture of that. Uh, so, and this is another one that just somebody just launched the other day, which is a tool for uh, basically like building up seeds for your tests uh, that will, you can kind of like build up these scripts and then sort of run them. I haven't used it myself, but I like that people are you know, innovating still uh, using Spark. Okay, let's just jump into what is a resource. I am not going to be able to finish this talk in time. Um, <coughs> so uh, a resource, let me just show you what it, yeah, what it actually sort of looks like to work with a resource. I'm not going to be able to get super down into the weeds because I've given that talk a couple times already. So if, you're, if this intrigues you, you can go watch one of those YouTube videos. Um, but this is an example resource. This is a very simple resource. It's a post. It has an attribute. Uh, and then uh, you can see here we've added an action to it. So actions are like the verbs that you can take with this. These are the interactions. And you can see that this is very declarative, and this is the way that we sort of do a synthesis of domain modeling with Ash at the same time as we build our application. We try to have those be the same thing effectively. Um, and so from this simple resource, we get uh, a functional interface, right? So I can call, like I can, you know, create one, I can filter it, I can search it, that sort of thing. I've left out some details like data layer stuff that would actually make this work, but uh, you know, we, can, we can use this resource. Um, we can also define an explicit code interface. So if you're you know, back in the Rails days, you might be remembered like these magically generated functions that map to like the things that you could do. Um, so we don't do that, everything's explicit, but you can get this nice uh, functional interface that will call your uh, application logic. Um, you can add a GraphQL with, that's pretty much all it takes. Like, that's not really an exaggeration. Uh, it takes basically no code. Uh, there's like a little bit of one-time setup that you do at the beginning to hook it all up. Um, and you can also get a JSON API. Same way, like, you, it's, that's pretty much all the code that it takes for, for that to work. <coughs> uh, and you can connect it up to uh, different data layers and configure those data layers uh, in the resource. So this is all of the code that does that. And all of those capabilities are, are basically contained right here. And this resource would work. Um, <coughs> yeah, and so wh what I think is really important to see here is that all of these, these little bits of our application that we're building up are introspectable. So other tools can be built on top of those structures. So and this is what allows us to continue to build more and more tools on top of Ash is, well, if you give me a resource, I know how to, fig I know how to discover what it can do. I know how to invoke those things, and so we can build big tools on top of your application. Okay, so uh, let's talk about some advanced features. I, I, there's, I'm only going to have to just sort of touch on you know some of these interesting things. There's no way to like fully educate on them. It's just not enough time. Um, but what's really important is that they, it's it's a big sort of building block system where all of these features leverage everything else that it can that they can know about the the resource. 
Um, so this is me working on those features. <laughs> Um, <coughs> so everything is built out of these standardized building blocks. So this is a, an example of what's called a change. Again, too small to read, but uh, similar to how in you, have, you might have plug in your application where you can, uh, you know, see like set up a sequence of events, right? And it gives you this little framework, a pretty mini framework. In Ash, we have the same thing for chaining uh, customizations over actions. Um, we have preparations, which are the same sort of thing, therefore uh, chaining customizations over queries. Uh, in this case, to give you an example here, this is a preparation that if you try to sort on one attribute, it will rewrite the sort to a different attribute. You know, there's a reason for it, but don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so we also have the option to manually override uh, system level behavior. This is an example of like an even sort of deeper uh, escape hatch where you can define a manual create action uh, and that just will say, don't do what the data layer would do. Don't insert into Postgres or whatever. I'll call this function and I'll do it myself. <coughs> Manual relationships. So this is, I think, a good uh, way to illustrate that like, this is not a sort of simple data mapper. You could have a manual relationship that would support uh, you know, reaching out to an external service to figure out which things are related or uh, reaching through 10 different tables and doing a bunch of complicated joins to figure out uh, what is related. We have uh, calculations. Calculations let you add computer properties to resources. Um, this is an example of like a functional calculation, um, but we also have expression calculations which can be run in the data layer. So in this example, uh, if you were to try to calculate like am I over the limit in this case, um, it will run that in SQL. We have aggregates which allow you to compute aggregate information over related data. Um, and you can actually lever you can use those. This question count here is an aggregate, so like the number of questions related to this thing. And then this example over here actually uses that to compute whether or not you're over your limit. <coughs> and then you can also use aggregates to sort of lift related data up from other you know, pieces of your application and make them a sort of first class part of, the, of, of that resource. We have policies. Man, I'm blasting through this stuff. Uh, so policies are a unified structure for you know, limiting individual user access uh, to your resources. Um, and we have a migration generator, so when you make changes, that's not the, the picture of a migration generator. I, I don't know where that one came from. Um, but uh, as you make changes to your resources, you run the migration generator and it figures out the Postgres migrations for you. Okay, extending Ash. So this is a bunch of random code, but uh, what I'm trying to illustrate here is when you write extensions for resources, you can make arbitrary modifications to the structure of that resource. So a good example is the archival extension will uh, go over every destroy action on a resource and rewrite it to actually be an update action that will set archived at and not actually a destroy. And you can kind of encapsulate that complexity under the hood and you can chain extensions and to make these, you know, uh, modifications to the resource. So it's a really powerful set of extensibility. It's not, that's like, extensions are not just necessarily hooks, like where I can say after do this and before do that. It's like you can make arbitrary changes. And this is an example of a really huge extension that we wrote for Ash HQ that will modify a research, uh, resource to make it full text searchable. And then that's how we power the search bar on our documentation site. So extensions often come along with configuration-driven tools that leverage the extension. So the extension on its own is really just gonna rewrite the DSL module that you have, that you're extending. Um, but then something else has to do something with that configuration. So in AshJSON API, for example, we might have controllers that will take a resource and an action, and it's like, how do I do that? Um, and so you generally don't have to worry about any of this, but this is the sort of rigging that happens. Um, and so extensions can fundamentally change the way that you use the framework. You can write extensions, and for our clients, almost all of them end up with a couple custom extensions that are tailoring it to themselves, and it's kind of that way. It's kind of like a build-your-own framework. So here's one that we have. This is publicly available. This is Ash State Machine, where uh, you can build out the state transitions, the available transitions, the way that your actions. So kind of like uh, if you've used like, there's like Ecto State Machine libraries that do sort of similar things. Uh, but it's enriched by the resource. So for each one of those state transitions, there's an, a corresponding action that actually like implements the logic. And so you can get these like this nice little declaration of what the rules of your application are, but more complex behavior implemented in the action. 
we have Ash Oban, which is a way to, like this is all that you need, and this will set up a scheduler and a worker that will monitor for things that are awaiting processing and call the process action on the resource for that record. So I think the thing I want to drive home there is that these extensions are super useful, but they were built with tools that are accessible to anybody else to write their own extensions. Um, and we have tons of built-in extensions, um, but you know we're making more all the time. All right, let's talk about what's new. How am I doing on time? I don't know when I started. What's that? I have 35 minutes? Oh my gosh. All right, I'm going to slow down. All right. Um, we'll have 30 minutes for questions. <laughs> <coughs> All right, uh, so what's new? Ash authentication, that new-ish, but it's, it's something that a lot of people are very excited about. It's uh, essentially like our version of what Mix Phoenix Gen Auth does. So, uh, but without the gen part of that, because I don't really like that style of building things. Um, no offense to the people who made it. Um, so uh, we've recently got, we've added open API and Swagger support, which was kind of a big deal when I guess open AI made chat GPT plugins and they're like, hey, you really need a, you need an open API for, to, to build. Uh, so every, as soon as they did that, everybody was like, hey, can we get open API for Ash JSON API, please? Um, and I'm sure they're all still waiting for getting off the waiting list for that, uh, for open AI, I mean. Um, but yeah, so this is all you have to do. You say, I also want to serve an open API schema at slash open API and job done. It builds the entire schema for you and now you can point a swagger spec, you know, all that sort of stuff. Or a swagger UI or whatever. Um, also not the right picture. There you go. Um, so we added union types and these are system level. Like these are in your application, they are union types. So in this case, it's like width, which could be a number, or it could be a string that maps to a percent, right? If you were storing HTML width in your database, you know. Um, but one of the things that became clear at that point is how do I reuse this, this uh, type that I've made? Um, and so quickly after union came uh, new type. And so new type lets you essentially wrap a, a type. Um, anyway, it lets you wrap a type in another module and then reuse that in your application. So we can say, uh, you know, attribute width and it's, uh, you know, instance of by width type, which is itself a union. And at this level, it might not be that impressive, but what's important to realize is that this actually is automatically included in your GraphQL schema. It gets an input type for the, or it gets a union, t is it a union type or a, whatever the GraphQL calls their alternative types, anyway. Um, and then it also gets a input that is like, we'll let the client decide which one they're trying to make. Uh, so we recently made uh, spark.dsl.fragment. So this is a way to split up basically people, we've got a lot of people who have been building with Ash for multiple years at this point, and they have these huge files. Um, and we just wanted to give them like a way to sort of, you know, split up their concerns for individual resources. And so when you add, you can split your resource up and add extensions to those, re to those fragments, and then the parent resource will actually be extended by those fragments. So it's a tool for organization, not so much reuse. Uh, streaming read actions. So you can stream your read actions instead of, uh, you know, getting them all at once, which is actually quite important because people are doing like large data processing and they don't want to, like, in your resource, you've defined what the rules of the read action are. You don't want to have to, like, go define a different version of it to stream, and the framework is smart enough to figure out how to stream the results of that read action for you. Uh, we've added support for locking. There's two different kinds of, well, they're the same locking, but there's two different ways you might use that, which is if you're running a query, you might ask us to lock the, the query, and this is at a data layer agnostic well, that's not the right way to phrase it. We still do it at the data layer, but we can imp you can implement locking in your own custom data layer. And uh, so in this way, like, we've kind of abstracted over the, the concept. Um, but then you can also just declaratively, like, if you wanted to have a specific update action in your resource that was serialized, there was never multiple of them happening at one time, uh, you can just use a one-liner in the action and say, you know, we want to lock this record for uh, whatever, in whatever way. 
um, and Ash State Machine and Ash Oban, which I showed you examples of earlier. Those also came out, I think, th this month or last month. Generic actions was a big one. Um, so basically, when we first built Ash, it was it was very like crud y, which is like a common you know complaint. Basically, you know, people would say, "Well, I'm not building crud. I'm building an application, and like my my stuff's too complicated for that." And what ultimately happened is these were actions were so customizable that it was actually kind of fine. Like you could figure out how to use a create action to do like whatever you wanted, and so we didn't have to write additional types of actions. But that was always the idea: is that there would be new kinds of action types. It's just we started with these four basic ones. Um, so we finally got to a point where we needed um, more generic action types, and so we've added this generic action that says I return. You know, this is practically like a function at this point. Um, but the point is that it's a function that can be automatically lifted up into GraphQL. So, or automatically lifted up into JSON API, or it will be automatically traced by your application's tracing setup, or that kind of thing. So, better than a regular function, I guess. <coughs> Bolt creates. That was another one that was, that was done very recently, which is a streamable batched insert into whatever data layer you have configured and your data layer can implement the ability to bulk create. So like in Ash Postgres, for example, this would be like an insert all statement uh, in, in Ecto. Um, and this is a really powerful concept, again, because you don't need to know what data layer a resource uses to use these, this utility. So if you wanted to write a CSV importer, you could write a generic CSV importer that would work against any resource and would you know, parse the CSV and call bulk create and Bob your uncle. Okay, what's coming up? We have a roadmap. That's a picture of it. It's still too small. Um, so, constant quality of life and ergonomics improvements. Ask anybody. I, you know, we're multiple commits a day, and you know, the top of that graph is 4,000 lines, and it's broken up by months. So, you know, lots of code going in and out of the framework. And this is just the core Ash library. So, we work uh, very hard on it. So bulk actions, I, I left this in here as coming up, but bulk create is just the first of this long roadmap. We're going to have bulk insert, or sorry, bulk updates, bulk destroys, and again, it will sort of, it'll honor the rules of your resource. So if you have like an update action, where after each update, it will create some other related resource or something like that, we'll actually like synthesize that. So we'll take up, you know, we'll insert, we'll update 500 things. Well, we won't batch up bulk updates. It's a long story, but we'll figure out all the things that we updated and then we'll call your hooks still to you know do get to update or create these new things and all of your transactional rules will be uh, honored and your validations and stuff you don't have to like rewrite parts of your application to support bulk operations <coughs> atomics are a huge one so this is actually something i'd say is missing in ash right now and it's one of the things that caused people to write manual actions which is like if you want to increment the score of you know like score equals score plus one, because somebody won a game or something. Um, right now, you have to dip down and do your own thing, call into Ecto. But uh, with this, you'll basically be able to um, combine some set of atomic updates with like regular, sort of computed from the last rec instance of the record. Um, and, if the record and if the update can be done entirely atomically, then it'll be a single insert. We won't even read the original record, that kind of thing. That's just one example of how you might make a uh, change atomic. <coughs> generators, this is a big one because I, I've always been a little bit against generators to some degree because we already strive to make Ash only require you to type the essential complexity of your problem. Like, so my thought was always you would have to do the same amount of typing. It would just be like on one line in a bash in, in your terminal instead of like in a file. Um, but I lost out on that one. The community has demanded <laughs> that we have generators, and so we will have generators. Um, I, think, I think they'll be good, especially the new project generator, because the real problem there is like some people want to use Phoenix with Ash, some people want to... If also, you can use Phoenix with Ash. They work together. Just want to make that clear. It's not Phoenix or Ash. Um, but so it can be complicated to make those choices, and we want to guide a user uh, down the path of like figuring out what a new application ought to look like. More extensions, uh, of course. Um, so we want to have SQLite, MySQL, and SQL Server extensions. Uh, 
not actually that big of a project. It's just I don't have a reason to use either of these databases yet, but we have stuff in the pipeline where they will. Um, and we're basically just going to copy Ash Postgres and like point it at a SQLite database and then change it until the tests pass. Um, so, you know, hopefully not too hard. Uh, so CQRS is, I think, uh, when, some, when people see the stuff like Ash where you have like these sort of, you know, create, update, destroy actions, um, what they see is something that is like anti-event oriented architectures. Um, however, what's important is the resource is just the model along with tools to sort of implement the model and the default stuff will just create something in the database. But we actually, somebody's built this, they built a commanded um, extension and it rewrites, if you're familiar with commanded, it's a event sourcing uh, tool for Elixir or maybe framework for Elixir. Um, and it will actually rewrite all of the mutation actions like create, update, and destroy to be events over your event stream. And then reads will go to like an aggregate, I forget the terminology that they use, but reads will become, uh, will read the aggregate of your, of your stuff. So we wanna make that first class, we wanna make that available. And it is, what's nice about it is you can design your resource like it's a really basic thing, create, update, destroy, or whatever, uh, figure out how your domain works. And then if you need it to be, an event source thing, you just use a different, you just add an extension, and now you have an event source system and you can hook into it and hook other things off those events. Uh, gRPC is on our short list, um, essentially producing, you know, protobufs and uh, things like that from your application so that you can essentially act as a gRPC server uh, out the gate. And uh, the, this is a little bit longer term, but we want to have uh, the concept of multi-data layer where you can orchestrate the, um, the interaction of multiple data layers. Like you might have, we have an ETS data layer, we have an amnesia data layer, and you might say, use the ETS data layer as a write through cache and use the Postgres data layer for the actual sort of persistence. And you, can, well, you should essentially be able to combine anything that implements our, our data layer protocol uh, in that way. All right, that's all of it. I was so convinced I was going to run out of time that I went way fast. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what we got. <laughs>